In this video, I'll be teaching you about synthesis using modular synthesizers and software called VCV Rack, which you can get for free on Mac, Windows, or Linux. On the left here, you'll see a section of chapter markers, which are all of the topics I'm going to cover. And you can skip to any of those using the chapter markers on YouTube if you want to jump directly to a particular section or replay something. The intended audience for this video is really basic beginners, people starting from the very beginning. So uh, if you've already used uh, VCV Rack, um, then this will probably be mostly review. If you already understand modular synthesis, then you won't need some of the basics at the beginning. But if you don't have any background with any of this, if you don't even know what synthesis is, that's fine. We'll be going over some of the very basics of that too. But a little bit of background will probably be helpful. So let's get started. What is synthesis? Synthesis is the electronic uh, creation of sounds. So a traditional musical instrument, like in the physical world, would be uh, creating sound via creating a vibration of some sort. So, uh, you know, violin bowing a string or blowing uh, a, into a woodwind instrument, vibrating a reed or hitting a drum. These are all things that produce changes in sound pressure in the air, which is how we hear things. Synthesis is the uh, use of an electronic device to uh, create sounds by uh, using electricity, voltages that change in amount very quickly to create uh, waveforms, and then uh, using a conversion process, converting that electricity into pressure through a set of speakers or a set of headphones, um, you know, moving the internal uh, physical components of the speaker to create changes in sound pressure, which again, vibrate our eardrums and we perceive as sound. So traditionally, uh, a synthesizer is something that people associate with like kind of a piano keyboard look. Uh, so if we go over to my browser here, I've got a picture pulled up of the Mini Moog Model D, which is a classic synthesizer, one of the earliest synthesizers. And uh, this is an example of what everyone usually thinks about when you think about a synthesizer. Um, so it's got a piano keyboard, which is the way that you play it. And then the sound is produced internally by a bunch of analog circuits. And you can control various parameters of how the sound is shaped with the uh, switches and dials on the faceplate. Uh, so this is kind of a standard synthesizer, but uh, key to our exploration here is that the piano keyboard part is actually not necessarily something that a synthesizer needs. Like that's a very um, standard way to input notes uh, to sort of control what the synth synthesizer is doing. But the synthesizer itself is really just the top part. It's the internals, it's the circuitry, it's the controls, and some sort of signal is needed to tell it what to do, but it doesn't have to be a piano keyboard. So in addition to physical world synthesizers like this, there's also software synthesizers. And here's an example of a very popular one. This is a screenshot from the software synthesizer Massive by Native Instruments. This was kind of uh, the precursor to dubstep and uh, a lot of that kind of wah, wah, wah sound that you, that you know that comes from uh, this synthesizer. It was a very different style of synthesis from the, the Mini Moog, uh, but the point is that there's no piano keyboard here. Uh, there's, no, there's nothing that you control in terms of how you actually play it. This is just the synthesizer's settings itself, and then it's controlled externally through some sort of signal. That's the basics of synthesis, the very, very, very basics. And now the next question is, what is modular synthesis and Eurorack? So a modular synthesizer kind of looks like this. It's a bunch of little boxes. Uh, each one is an individual component, and they have these little cable slots. They're called patch points, and the cables that connect them are called patch cables. They're just uh, standard 3.5 millimeter jack mono audio cables like the same kind of thing that you'd use to plug in a pair of headphones to your laptop. The difference between the synthesizers that we looked at in the previous screenshots and a modular synthesizer is that each internal component of what builds up the larger synthesizer is a discrete unit. Uh, so each one of these little boxes does one function, essentially. And in order to control the signal flow, like where, where the signal starts and how it gets processed by each component, is determined by you by patching inputs and outputs together across the various modules in your system and shaping the sound that you want and creating something that's entirely your own. So it's uh, important to understand that even in something like this, there are essentially modules in it in a conceptual sense. 
Um, we'll talk about what sort of the main categories of modules are in a bit, but you can think of this having modules internally, but they're in a fixed order. And the path that the electrical signal takes to create sound inside them is essentially fixed. Some synthesizers allow you to sort of rearrange that a little bit via um, patch points or controls, but mostly what you see is what you get. Like there's a fixed number of functions in the synthesizer and the way that they all connect together is predetermined. So that can be really easy. It's great for, for getting started because you don't have to worry about how to connect everything and you can just get started making music. But modular synthesis allows you to be incredibly creative and experimental and it allows you to have a lot of fun designing a synthesizer that does exactly what you want and something that's unique to your taste and sometimes something that you even get by accident by experimentation. And what is Eurorack specifically? Well, Eurorack is a standard for modular synthesizers. There are several different standards, but Eurorack is the most popular by far. It has the most number of modules available and probably the most number of users. Eurorack is just a standard uh, which defines like the physical height of a module and some details about how its power is connected and uh, some details about like how the electrical signals should be processed and what the ranges of voltages it accepts are, things like that. So VCV rack is a Eurorack module sort of virtual implementation. And let's talk about that. So here's VCV Rack's website, vcvrack.com. Um, again, this is available for free for Mac and Windows and Linux, and you can go ahead and download it. Um, if you want to follow along with what I'm doing, uh, you'll want to download it and then also install some modules that are free but are not installed by default. To find modules, what you do is you click on this library link at the top. And you'll be taken to this uh, searchable index that has all of the light, all of the modules that are available. You can filter by brand. You can filter by tag, which has sort of different categories of modules. And uh, to install a particular module, let's go to, for example, Bog Audio, which is some of the modules I'll be using. Select it here, and then you can just pick pretty much any one of these. And then right here, it'll say plugin. You click on the Bog Audio plugin, and you'll see that there's a whole bunch of modules that are part of this same plugin. There'll be a link here that says subscribe. Um, it says unsubscribe to me, for me because I'm already subscribed, but you go ahead and click subscribe and do that for all the modules you want to install. And then come back into VCV Rack and you click on library here, and it'll say querying for updates. And then if there's anything to be installed that is not already on your local system, it'll give you a prompt to install it here. Once you do, you'll have to restart the VCV Rack software for the new modules to be available. Inside the uh, software, if you right click anywhere on the screen, you'll get your VCV Rack module library. And these are the modules that I'm going to be using in this video. So if you want to follow along or recreate what I've done here, these are the ones you'll need. A lot of them are built in modules from VCV. Uh, you see these little VCV logo. Um, those are built in, so I think you don't have to install anything special beyond the program itself. But here are the other ones that you'll need to install to get what I've got. Uh, the modules from Impromptu, from Bog Audio, from Valley, from All Right Devices, from Audible Instruments, from Count Modula, from Hora. And this last one, I'm not sure how to pronounce, but it's N-Y-S-T-H-I, Nisthi. That's a tuner. Okay, so you can press escape to get out of that screen. And then we can get started. Let's talk briefly about the interface. Uh, so what we're looking at, again, mimics what we saw in the physical world. We've got rows and rows of rack space. This, these like little metal bars are rack rails and this black thing is a is a set of power headers so in the physical world these are little metal or plastic boxes and they have screw holes at the top so you can drop these in and kind of screw them in to these rack rails and place them in any order you want each one of these modules will have a power connector as well so uh, they use standard ribbon cables with 10 pins on one side and eight pins on the other side and you have a power uh, source connected to your rack, and you connect the module to one of these power headers with a ribbon cable. And then when you turn on the entire system, each module gets power. 
We won't talk about uh, the details of uh, power usage in your rack because we're really concentrating on the virtual environment and understanding concepts. Uh, and the nice thing about VCV rack is that you don't actually have to worry about power because it's all virtual. So if you want to move a module around, it's really easy. You can just kind of slide, click and click and slide. You can move them between the rack rails and you can zoom in and out. And you can, so you can see that we actually have an infinite number of racks, a rack uh, rows, which is very, very handy. So you can see I have a few modules set up here already. You don't have to worry about this for now. It's just the very basics of what I need in order to get the recording working. Um, but to just briefly describe this notes one is just to help me remember what we're looking at uh, and what, what to talk about. The mixer is to just uh, mix multiple audio signals together. We'll be using that uh, towards the end of the video. Uh, this audio module here is sending the uh, audio produced by the system out to my uh, audio interface and my headphones so that I can hear what I'm doing. And this recorder module is what's actually capturing uh, the audio that I'm playing and saving it to a file so I can add it to the video after the fact. Okay, so let's talk about the various types of modules that are available. Um, you can see that if I uncheck this filters button, there's quite a lot of modules that I have installed just from subscribing to these various module companies. And there's a lot built into VCV Rack also. So for a beginner, this probably feels very overwhelming. Just like, oh my God, all of these have so many buttons and knobs and dials. Like, how could I ever learn what any of these do, let alone all of them? And how do I know which ones to use in which circumstances? And how do, they, how do I decide how they all connect together? Well, the good news is that you don't have to use all of them. In fact, you can do a lot of interesting things with very, very few of them. The other good news is that there's some categorization for these modules that helps break them down into groups that makes it a little easier to understand. So let's look at this tags uh, dropdown. And these tags, by the way, match what's on the VCV Rack website. If we go back to the library and go under tag here, you can use the same tags to find modules of particular categories. So uh, there's still a lot of categories and the, it takes some time to understand what all of these different things mean. But once you start to understand the basics and you can understand a category of module, then uh, you can really start to get a sense of how the different pieces sort of plug into each other to form a standard signal flow. And in particular, once you really understand a particular category, it makes it much easier to understand why two modules of this in the same category are different from each other and why you might want to use one versus the other. But to break this down even more and uh, group it into smaller groupings to really understand the basics, I think you can divide modules into essentially three broad categories. Uh, there's modules that are sound sources that actually produce a rapidly changing voltage that will create an audio signal. There's processor modules, which will take an audio signal as input, do something to it to manipulate it, and then output the manipulated signal out the back. And then there's uh, control signals and modulation. And those are not audio, but they're uh, signals that can be used to control and manipulate the settings of other modules or even of themselves. And that's kind of how you program what you want your setup to do. So pretty much every module I think could fall into one of those three categories. The second and third one in particular, obviously there's a vast uh, array of different subcategories of those and that's where these tags come into play. But I think those are sort of the, the, the three main categories that can help you understand how a signal flow is put together. In this video, we're gonna be building a patch and a patch by the way is what you call essentially a setup of the modules that you're using and the cable connection that you're using and all of the settings that you're using. When we're done, that's our patch. We're going to talk about the type of synthesis that we're using in the patch that we're making today. There's a lot of different types of synthesis because, you know, synthesis is essentially uh, an electronic process that happens with electricity and in the physical world, usually in analog circuits um, or sometimes in digital circuits. And oh, the type of synthesis that we're going to be using is called subtractive, but there are other types as well, such as additive and wavetable and many others. Subtractive synthesis is, uh, I think, the easiest to understand, um, and it's probably the most common uh, way to learn synthesis. Uh, 
Uh, you sometimes will hear subtractive synthesis referred to as East Coast synthesis, means the same thing. The idea is that you take a single waveform, which is like a sound source, essentially, and that waveform is very harmonically rich. What that means we'll talk about in a second. You take this harmonically rich waveform and you slice out pieces of the waveform. You slice out part of the harmonic range to reduce and shape the sound in getting what you want. So that's the approach that we'll be taking here. It's a very standard approach, and I think it'll make it easier to understand uh, how to build a sound in modular. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit more about what I mean by a rich waveform. So when you uh, hear a sound, uh, the thing that makes it sound different from other sounds is the harmonic spectrum and its harmonic content. If you play a, a, like a, a C on a violin, or you play a C on a clarinet, you're playing the same pitch, you can hear that it's the same note, but you can also tell the difference between a violin and a clarinet. The reason for that is because they have different harmonic content. So the, the lowest pitch that's being played is called the fundamental. It's like a very specific frequency in scientific terms. But these instruments also create pitches at higher frequencies, at higher pitches. And the distance apart between all of the different uh, pitches that are produced by the sound of that instrument and their relative volume is what gives them the distinctive character that allows you to tell them apart. A waveform that's harmonically rich has a lot of additional harmonics beyond the fundamental. And uh, we can carve away some of those harmonics using a process called filtering that we'll talk about later. This might all be a little abstract, so I think it's time to start moving on and we'll start to visualize some of this stuff to make it easier to understand. So let's talk about oscillators, aka VCOs. Oscillators are your sound source in a synthesizer. Uh, now, if you recall, the way that sound works in the physical world is by the pressure of the air getting more and less dense in rapid succession, which moves your eardrums back and forth, which we perceive as sound. So to model that sort of back and forth representation in electricity, we use voltages that quickly go back and forth between two different strengths. Let's uh, start with our oscillator so we can see how this works. So this is VCO. This is the most basic oscillator module that's built into VCV rack. We're also going to add one more module called scope. This is an oscilloscope, and this will allow us to visualize what the oscillator is doing. We have to remember that hearing is not the primary sense for humans. We're much more strong visually, uh, I think, in general. And so when you're learning some of this stuff, it can be kind of hard to hear two different sounds and hear them change and really understand what's happening. And by being able to see a visual representation of the waveform, it's really helpful in understanding what's happening. So I think a, an oscilloscope is an absolutely essential tool uh, for synthesis and absolutely for, for beginners and for learning. I may not have mentioned already, but these little holes are the patch points. And the, on the VCV rack modules, the convention is that the ones with the dark background are outputs and the other ones are inputs. So you create a patch point by left clicking on something and that which creates a cable and then you drag it to the place you want to connect it to. So in this case, our VCO has four outputs that can be used simultaneously. We have sine, triangle, saw, and square. These are four different types of waveforms that we'll look at. Uh, so you can see immediately we start to see this visual representation of what a sine wave is. It's a little hard to see when it's so uh, zoomed out. So what I'm going to do is change this time knob to adjust the uh, period of time that we're looking at. Currently, we're from left to right. This is a period of about 500 milliseconds, but that's way too long to really understand what a sine wave is. So I'm going to turn this knob to the right, which is going to reduce the period that we're visualizing and go down to about maybe 20 seconds. And let's set it into trigger mode. And now you see what this is. So uh, the, let me explain the oscilloscope. So this little gray line with the T in the middle is sort of like the zero voltage point. That's neutral. As, on the Y axis, as the line goes up towards the top, that's the voltage increasing. And it, as it goes down below the, the middle gray line, that's the voltage decreasing into negative voltage. So the X axis is time and the Y axis is amplitude or in the case of uh, sound source, it's volume. 
So that's what we hear. The, the taller the waveform, the louder it will be. Okay, so this is what a sine wave looks like. It starts at the zero point. It sort of curves up in a very smooth shape to a positive voltage. Then it comes back down, goes back down below, and kind of does the inverse where it does a curve at the bottom and then comes back up to the zero point. And so that's a single cycle of the waveform. And then it just does that repeated forever. And let's hear what that sounds like. If I take the output of this input and send it to our mixer, we will hear the sine wave. So you can hear it's a very pure tone and it's just one note that just goes on forever. It doesn't start or stop and it doesn't change what it sounds like in any way. It just goes forever. The reason it's the pitch that it is, is because of the frequency that's controlled by this knob right here. The frequency is how often this repeated pattern happens, how quickly it's repeated. So if I change the frequency, let's watch what happens on the scope and also listen to what happens to the audible sound. Okay, so what we saw there was that as the frequency increases, the pitch gets higher, and as the frequency decreases, the pitch gets lower. Frequency is just the scientific term and the scientific explanation for what pitch is. Pitch is, is just the musical term for frequency, essentially. And so a frequency and a pitch are increased, uh, the x-axis essentially kind of gets squished, like the waveform continues to be the same shape, but it repeats more times in the same period of time. Uh, the, the measure of frequency is hertz, which is cycles per second. So at this note right here, or at this frequency, the sine wave is repeating its basic waveform 261.63 times per second. We should note that the range of what humans can perceive goes from about 20 hertz at the low end to about 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz at the high end. Obviously, there are sounds that we can produce in the world that are above and below that range, uh, but we can't hear them. And a classic example of that is a dog whistle. Like the dog whistle is something with a very high pitch that dogs are able to hear, but humans are not because the pitch that it creates or the frequency that it oscillates at is above that 20,000 uh, hertz threshold. I also want to point out that this particular VCO can actually go below and uh, below the range of what we can hear. So you can see that frequency value in the tooltip is now going down, 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 and we're getting to 20, which is the threshold of what we can hear. Actually, I should turn on the, uh, the level so we can hear this. So you hear that really low tone. And as I approach 20, it gets really, really low and barely audible if you're not using headphones at, at a high volume and it may not even be able to hear that low tone. And then when we get down below 20, you can't hear anything. Well, what is the point of a frequency so low that we can't hear it? Well, I want you to save that question because we're going to get back to it in a little bit. Okay, let's look at a few other waveforms. So that's the sine wave, and as we noted, it's like a very, very pure sound. Let's listen to a triangle wave and look at how it's different. So you can hear it has a different sound. It's a little more buzzy, I guess, you might describe it as. Not quite as pure, and the shape is different. It's got, it's kind of more angled. Uh, now, this is not an exact representation of how you'd usually see a triangle wave. It's usually, you wouldn't see really any curve at all. It would be just like a completely flat edge with a sharp point. But it's similar to a sine wave in that it goes up and then back down to neutral, then down in the inverse, and then back up to neutral. So by changing the oscillation of this voltage, we change not only its sort of visual representation, but we also change 
the way it sounds and the fact that it sounds more buzzy and ha- has kind of a thicker sound that's the harmonic uh, frequency content that I was talking about earlier so in addition to the fundamental which is all we hear with a sine wave there are also additional frequencies that are happening at higher uh, higher values but with varying volumes and that creates this distinctive sound let's listen to a saw wave So this is different again. You can see this one has an even richer and more buzzy sound because it has a lot more harmonic content. And the traditional shape, uh, again, it's a little skewed here, but you traditionally see this looking as like a straight angled line going up and then going immediately down and then a straight angled line going back up. It kind of mimics the way that a saw work looks in in the physical world, which is why it's called that. Okay, and finally, let's look at the square wave. This is also a very harmonically rich waveform. You can hear it has like a little bit more of a hollow sound than the saw wave, which was a little buzzier. But you can hear that they're all the same pitch, like all of these have been the same. Like if you were going to sing that, you would sing the same note for all of those but they sound different, as though they were different instruments. So the square wave, uh, it's a little off in this particular representation, but the way you usually see it drawn is with like a totally flat bottom and a totally flat top. So it's essentially just at two extremes of the voltage range. It's like all the way up and then immediately goes all the way down and then immediately goes all the way up and repeats. And so you get kind of this jagged back and forth square. Okay, so those are four classic waveforms that are used in synthesis and very commonly in subtractive synthesis. So most oscillators that you use will have uh, at least one of these waveforms. Okay, so now we understand the basics of what uh, a VCO is, an oscillator. I should say that the VC is for voltage controlled. And the reason it's called that is because we can send it voltages from other sources to control the frequency and other. Uh, aspects of this, which we will do later. Okay, so if we want to make music with this, it's not particularly interesting to just have this constant tone that never changes in any way. It's always the same pitch. It's always the same volume. It always has the exact same harmonic content. It's not really music unless you want to be very, very avant-garde. So let's think about some ways that we can make this more musical. Well, the first most obvious one is to actually have the note start and stop. Like if you were playing a note on an instrument in the physical world, like a piano, you press the key down and then you release it and the sound stops. It doesn't just go forever. So in order to change the volume of the sound, we're going to use a module called an amplifier or a VCA. So let me grab a VCA. That's this guy right here. And we're going to insert this into the mix. I'm going to put it in between the oscillator and the scope so that when we make changes to the VCA, we can see what's happening. So you can see the inputs and outputs are super simple. There's just an audio input and an audio output, and then one other input that's labeled CV, which we'll talk about in a bit. And then we've got these yellow bars. Well, these yellow bars are really just like a fader, kind of like these over here. And what they do is exactly the same as these mixer faders do, is they control the volume. So if I click and drag down, you can hear that the sound gets quieter. And if you look at the scope, you see that the waveform is kind of getting squashed vertically. Because again, what that waveform is, is an electrical signal that's very rapidly increasing and decreasing in voltage. And the stronger the peaks of the voltage at both the positive and the negative end, the louder we perceive the sound because more air is being moved in the physical world. Okay, so now we have the ability to control this by moving it up and down. But I'm doing this by hand, like I'm just clicking and dragging with the mouse. And that's not particularly realistic. And if I wanted to, you know, like make a pitch that starts and stops, 
So we need something else to sort of do this for us, to control it. Like we want it to behave like a piano where I press a key and the sound comes out and I release a key and then it stops and I don't have to manually control exactly how loud it is at every individual microscopic moment. So what we're going to use for this is one form of modulation called an envelope. And we're going to use this module here from VCV Rack. This is called ADSREG, which is a bit of a mouthful. But what it stands for is Attack, Decay, Sustain, Release, Envelope Generator. So envelopes are a form of modulation that have kind of a beginning and an end. They're just like a little shape that gets played back. And this yellow line uh, is kind of like the scope. It, like The vertical axis is the voltage level, and the, y, uh, the x axis is time. And so when, an, uh, when the envelope starts, it increases in voltage, and then it slowly de decreases, and then it slowly decreases some, some more until it's back to zero. The bottom is like the zero point, essentially. So it's, it's unipolar. It only goes up in one direction, unlike an audio waveform, which is bipolar, where it goes uh, both positive and negative. So what we can do is we can send a signal to this envelope generator to cause it to essentially play back this shape and then send that voltage that it's creating to something else to control that other thing. So in order to talk to, before we get more into the details of uh, how this uh, envelope generator works, we're going to uh, have to take a little bit of a detour into some other uh, topics. So let me actually turn off the sound for now so we don't get annoyed because that is pretty annoying listening to that same tone forever. So we need to talk about control signals in Eurorack modular synthesis. Um, there's three, or there's really four types of signals uh, in a modular system. The obvious one is audio. Uh, and I should note, actually, I don't think I mentioned before that a special thing about the Eurorack standard is that uh, the voltages used for control signals and for audio are in the same rate. It uses very, very high signals that are higher than most other electronic equipment. And the result is that you can actually use an audio waveform as a control signal and vice versa. I think, I think that the uh, standard range is like between uh, positive and negative 10 volts, if I'm not mistaken. It's the range that you'll definitely, uh, you'll generally see uh, signals working in. So obviously we've been working with audio signals so far, which is just, you know, electricity getting stronger and weaker in terms of voltage. Uh, but then we also have these other three types of uh, signals that, that can be used. So in, in any case, it's just electricity changing voltage, but how that voltage is interpreted by the module that's receiving it determines what of these types of things it is. So we've got gates, we've got triggers, and we've got CV. So for gates and triggers, I think it would be most helpful to look actually at the square wave. Let me turn the amplifier back up, but I'm going to turn the level back off so we don't hear it, but we're just looking at it. Now, again, this, this uh, representation when the scope is not exactly accurate to what a traditional square wave is. You can see we have this little jagged edge here, and the uh, sections at the top and bottom are not exactly straight across flat. But if you imagine that they were, it'll help understand uh, this. So a gate is something that in the real world would be equivalent to playing a key on the piano keyboard. When you hold down the key, uh, the gate is on, like a note is happening. And then when you release the key, the gate goes off. The, key, the note is no longer being played. And in the modular world, that's represented by essentially like a binary state of voltages. When the voltage is high, the gate is on, the note is playing. When the voltage is low, the gate is off, the note is not playing. As far as I know, there isn't like a standard for exactly what voltage is considered on and off when talking about gates, but generally there's just like kind of a broad distinction between high and low. So it might be something like 10 volts is on and zero is off, or maybe five volts is on and zero is off, or maybe anything positive is on and anything negative is off. Um, it may it may differ from module to module, but as far as I know, you don't really run into problems where something, or not very often at least, where uh, the gate signal produced by one thing is not understood as a gate by the thing receiving it. Anyway, that's the basic use of a gate and what a gate signal is. A trigger is very similar to a gate. Uh, in fact, you can use the same uh, waveform for both. Uh, 
The difference with a trigger is that there isn't like a sustain phase when the gate is on. So again, if we think of that piano example, uh, or especially on like an electronic keyboard, whenever you hold down the note, the note kind of keeps playing until you release it. A trigger is something where we don't care about that length that the note is held down. We only care about the event of the note going from its off position to its on position. So a way to imagine this in the physical world would be like hitting a drum with a stick. There isn't like, like how long you hold down the stick on the drum may have a little bit of effect on its sound, but really it's kind of got a built in sort of decay of a volume. You hit it and it's an event and the sound kind of dips away by itself and that that's in sort of a fixed amount of time. So that's a, a trigger. So in a, in a trigger, a module receiving a trigger signal will listen for points in which the voltage goes from low to high. And then it will ignore the gate staying high after that point until it goes low again. And then it'll listen for the next time when it transitions from low to high. So we use triggers to signal events that need to happen. Uh, it could be producing a sound or you know some sort of other uh, event in the modular system. And finally, we have CV, which I think is best illustrated by the classic sine wave. CV stands for control voltage. And uh, it's like a gate and a trigger in the sense that it's just voltage that's changing. But the difference with CV is that it, uh, it, we care about all the individual microscopic points in between the two extremes. So, you know, just like a gate and a trigger, it can have a high point, it can have a low point, uh, but all of these individual values actually matter. And you can imagine that like going up and down on sort of the, the, the voltage range is kind of equivalent to turning a knob manually with your hand. Like as the voltage goes higher, the knob is turned farther to the right. As the voltage goes down, the knob is turned farther to the left. Uh, and uh, it's not illustrated here by the sine wave, but uh, it's not necessary for a control voltage signal to repeat the way that an audio signal does, where it's like kind of the same shape that just repeats over and over and over forever. Con control voltage is arbitrary. So actually the perfect example here is this uh, this envelope generated by the EG. So you see how it kind of goes up and then it goes down and then it goes down. It creates this very distinctive shape that is just a graph of the value over time, the, 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 the voltage over time. That's a, v, a CV signal, a control voltage signal, and that's used to control things where these intermediate uh, values may, uh, are meaningful. Okay, so that's gates, triggers, and CV. Uh, let's put that to use in our next section, which is clocks. Clocks is how you synchronize things in modular and how you keep track of musical concepts like tempo. So for our clock, we're going to use this module called Clocked from Impromptu. It's a great clock module. And what this does is it creates a... Uh, let's uncheck this for now. This creates a, a gate or trigger signal. So uh, let's take this output from this CLK clock output and send it into our scope. And I think I'm going to have to change the time value here for us to be able to see anything. Okay. So you see that? What we're seeing here looks a whole lot like a square wave. And in fact, it is a square wave. It's exactly the same thing as this, this uh, square wave output from the VCO, except that in the case of the VCO, uh, the rate that the square wave pattern repeats is very, very fast so that we can perceive it as audio. And in the case of a clock coming from clocked, the rate is such that uh, it's synchronized to like uh, a musical tempo. See this 120 beats per minute. That's saying that 120 times per minute, the gate will be high. If we think of each of these upward sections as an individual pulse or a beat. 120 of those will happen in a single minute. And so the modules that are expecting gates or clocks are going to receive th these high voltages and count those as beats or pulses. So this is how we can add a tempo. And in particular, because as I, as I described, gates and triggers are really the same signal. It's just a matter of how the receiving module interprets it. We can use this gate as a trigger and we can use it to trigger the envelope generator. So let's go back and let's move the envelope, or sorry, the clock output into the gate input of the ADSR EG. And you can see that, uh, and it's maybe a little confusing because I, I called it a trigger and that it calls it a gate here. Uh, 
Uh, actually, no, that's true. It, it is a gate, and the reason is because the sustain phase is a hold. We'll talk about that in a second. So you can see that every time this thing blinks, it's receiving a high voltage from the clocked module into its gate. And the start of each uh, high voltage in the sort of repeating pattern triggers this envelope to happen one time. And we see the little dot follow the line. Let's slow it down a bit so it's a little easier to see that. Maybe make it about 45 BPM. So this is where the ADSR part of this comes into play. Again, this stands for attack, decay, sustain, and release. And this is the by far the most common type of envelope. There are several others, but this is the one that you'll see most often. So these four controls refer to these four segments of the sound. So attack is... Actually, I should turn the sound up so we can hear it again. So let's uh, send the output of the envelope into the control. Uh, so we're going to do a sine wave input. Okay, so you can already hear what's happening. I, I did that a little fast, so let me explain what I did. So we've got the audio output of the sine wave going into the audio input of the amplifier. We've got the output of the amplifier going into the scope so we can see what's happening. And then we have the output of the envelope generator, essentially the envelope that it's creating, into this CV input of the VCA. And so what's happening is that the voltage from the envelope is being used to automatically change the value of the VCA, which in effect makes the sound uh, louder and quieter. And you can see the volume reflected by the scope over here, that when it starts, it's much taller on the y-axis, and then as it gets quieter, it gets smaller. So this is what an envelope can do for us when applied to an amplifier. It can change the volume automatically over time. So now let's talk about that ADSR part. So the ADSR is for controlling these different segments. The attack controls how quickly the volume or the, the value goes from zero to its maximum point. So as I drag the slider down, the sound will start more immediately and not have that slow fade in that we're hearing. And then as I drag it up, it'll get slower again. Sustain, we're going to skip ahead to sustain, that's the volume of, or I guess the, the value that will be sustained as long as the gate stays high. So this is again in, in you know, piano terms, like how long you're holding down the key. As long as you're holding down that key, the voltage will stay at whatever level you set by the sustain slider, and that's kind of our middle point right here. The decay is how long it takes from that initial peak to reach the sustain volume. So if I make the sustain really low, you'll be able to hear it more audibly. even actually reaching the sustain volume because the clock is so slow. Let me slow it down some more. There you see that? See how it kind of goes down and then it hovers for a second on the dot on that little circle and then it goes down again? That's the sustain. So it reaches the end of the decay stage. It hovers on the sustain level until the voltage coming in goes low. And then when the voltage coming in goes low, uh, goes low again, that triggers the release stage. So the release is how long it takes for the volume to go all the way back to zero after the gate has gone to the low, its low point. And so you can control that to make it kind of stop immediately or fade out slowly. So you can see at the extreme here, the next note starts before the first one even finishes releasing. In any case, this is one way in which we have made our sound more interesting from what we started with. We just had initially a solid tone that went forever, but now we have 
a sound that is at least starting and stopping and its volume changes. It's a little bit more interesting than just a single tone that goes forever. Okay, that's all well and good, but it's still not the most interesting thing in the world. Next, let's move on to filtering, which is a way to shape the timbre or quality of a sound when we're using subtractive synthesis. So for this, let's go back to our saw wave, which has a, a harmonically rich waveform. It'll be easiest to hear. So this is to remind you what a saw wave sounds like. What a filter does is it cuts away some of the frequency spectrum. So here's our filter that we're going to use, this VCF. And let's stick that. Uh, so we, we can, it can really go before or after the, the amplifier. I think we'll do it afterward. So we're going to change this routing so that the amplifier goes into the input of the uh, VCF. And then we're going to take this LPF output, which I'll explain in a second. Okay, so now we're hearing the same thing we were hearing before. The, essentially, the filter is not doing anything yet. This is uh, in the category of what I described as a processor earlier. This is something that takes an audio signal, does something to it, and then outputs the modified signal. So this filter has two different types. Uh, the one I'm using right now is called a low-pass filter. What this is going to do is it's going to cut away some of the higher frequency content in the harmonic spectrum. Uh, which we perceive as sort of the brightness of the sound. As those higher harmonics are going to cut away, you're going to hear the sound's brightness decrease and get duller. Listen as I bring this cutoff knob down. So you can see that not only does it change the brightness, but it also changes the volume. And you can see that represented in the scope. The reason for that is because the total volume of a sound is made up of the volume of all of its harmonics. And as we start to remove harmonics with the filter, the total volume starts to decrease. And because we're filtering a particular part of the spectrum, it also has a distinctive effect on the quality of the sound by making it bright, less bright by reducing those upper harmonics. There's also a high pass filter, which is the reverse of what we're hearing now. A high pass filter will cut away the lower harmonics, leaving only the upper ones. So if we flip this dial to the other side and then use the high pass filter input, at the lowest setting, we'll hear the unfiltered noise or the unfiltered audio. And as we increase the cutoff, it'll start to cut away the low frequencies and we'll hear only the highs. Listen. It gets real buzzy and quiet up at the top when we're not hearing any of the lower notes. And it's interesting to note that, as I mentioned earlier when we were talking about harmonics, that the main pitch that you hear when something is playing is the fundamental, which is the lowest harmonic, the lowest frequency. And we've actually cut that out in this case, but we're still hearing a pitch. And it's kind of a psychoacoustical effect that our brains are able to sort of fill in what that lowest note is. So we still hear the same pitch, even though a lot of the content is, is filtered away, including the fundamental itself. A standard filter also has a couple of other uh, functions. Uh, resonance is the most common, and some will also have drive. Let's switch back to the low pass filter to hear this. So what resonance does is it increases the amplitude of the signal, like the volume, the strength, uh, right around the cutoff point. So uh, I'm going to do a quick sweep of the filter where I'm going to kind of drag it low and then back high, and then I'm going to increase the resonance and do it again. Listen to the difference. <laughs> 
got kind of a weird squelchy sound. That's the effect that we perceive as a result of increasing the volume of the signal right around the cutoff point. There's also drive, which is kind of a feedback. It'll take some of the filter's output and send it back into the input to create kind of a distortion. If I turn this up, it'll actually make the resonance easier to hear. Hear that? Okay, so let's leave it with a little resonance and a little drive. Okay, so that's another way that we can make our sound more interesting. But similar to when we started with the VCA, in order to change the sound over time and in order to change its quality with the filter, I have to manually move one of these knobs, which is not really realistic. If I want to be you know, playing something on the keyboard to play some music, I don't have a hand free to constantly turn this thing. And if I want it to sort of sync to the tempo in some way, that's going to be pretty hard to do. So what are we going to do? We are going to automate it. And we're going to use, once again, an envelope generator. So let's grab another EG. And let's uh, stick it in between here. We're going to take a copy of the clock signal, which uh, you can do by holding, uh, I'm on a Mac, so I hold down Command and drag to duplicate the cable. And we're going to send this into the gate of this other envelope. And then we're going to take the output of this envelope and we're going to apply it to the cutoff input. So let's put the cutoff maybe uh, right here, kind of at a kind of a midpoint. So we've got a second envelope here that we can control separately from this one. And we're going to take the output and instead of applying it to the volume, we're going to apply it as automation to the position of the cutoff knob to change the timbre or quality of the sound over time. It's going to trigger once per beat, once per per high voltage from this clock source. And uh, notice that we're not hearing anything yet, even though I plugged it in. The reason be is because of this little knob here. This is called an attenuverter. What it does is it reduces the strength or voltage of the incoming signal on its associated input. When it's in its sort of neutral position, it's at 0%. So it's actually completely ignoring all of the signal that's coming in here. But as I drag it to the right, it's going to slowly increase the amount that this incoming signal is affecting the associated control. Listen. As I bring the cutoff down lower, it'll be more obvious. as it starts. We can change the ADSR settings to kind of make it more prominent. Let's have it start immediately and decay very quickly and go to a very low sustain. You hear that? You hear how it, how it kind of has a kind of wow right at the beginning? That's because the automation coming from this signal is essentially like turning the knob to the right like instantly and then slowly turning it back down, holding it at a particular sustain level until the gate goes low and then bringing it back to its position here. It's uh, important to note that the zero point here is not zero on this dial. Zero is like where I've positioned it. This is like an offset. So the highest point is the highest, but it's all relative to where I've manually set the cutoff knob. So the, the uh, envelope is kind of moving it in between the highest point and here. And so if I move the cutoff knob, it'll change the range of what the envelope is causing. So the, the, the lower I put the knob, the more prominent the effect of the filter envelope is. Okay, cool. 
So this is a lot more interesting than what we started with, where we just had a noise that was, or a sound, a pitch that was going forever with no change whatsoever. Now we've got a change in volume, and we've also got a change in quality or timbre. Let's talk about one more type of modulation. This is a big, important one. And let me turn this off for a second so we don't get annoyed by the sound. So the last type of, of uh, modulation that I want to talk about to uh, make this sound more interesting is LFOs, low-frequency oscillators. Now, if you remember back in the, the uh, section about the oscillator, I talked about how uh, the frequency control allows you to go way down below the range of human hearing into these low hertz settings. And we asked, like, what is the point of that if you can't hear them? We'll also recall that I said in, uh, in Eurorack, the voltage range for audio and control signals are the same. So what that means is that you can take one of these very low frequency rates and use it as a form of automation, similar as to what we did with the envelope generator, to control some parameter on another module. So we're going to take another module called LFO, aptly named. This is from PCV Rack. Let's stick that in here. I'm getting a bit wide on the screen, so let me scroll to the right again. An LFO is literally just an oscillator, but it's much, much lower in frequency range. So you can see at the default position of the VCO, it's at 261.63 hertz, and the LFO at its default position is at 2 hertz, which is very, very low. If I drag it up, it goes to 1,000 hertz. So this is kind of interesting because the LFO and the VCO, these particular implementations, actually go into the range of the other one. So you can, if you turn the LFO up high enough, it will actually go into audio range, where if you output that to an amplifier, you'll hear a pitch. But most of its range is below 20 hertz, which is not audible. And so this is what we can use for control signals. You'll see that the controls here look exactly the same as uh, the ones on the VCO. And again, that's because an LFO and a VCO are kind of fundamentally the same thing. Let's take the sine wave output and let's plug it into our second input on the scope so we can see this trace. So there's our sine wave. And let's turn the clock back on. So that the blue section is the audio that we're hearing and the yellow line is the signal from this uh, LFO sine wave. Now, if we take that signal, that LFO, from running through the scope, and we apply it to some sort of setting, then it will change that setting over time. Let's try it with uh, the resonance on the filter. That might be pretty easy to hear. And remember, we have to increase the value of the attenuverter because it's zero by default, which just ignores the input. You hear that squelchiness that's changing in kind of a cyclic way? That's because that sine wave from the LFO is going up and down in voltage and applied to the resonance control of the filter. It's essentially the equivalent of moving the knob back and forth like this. But by using our LFO, we don't have to do it manually. We just set the default point, and then the LFO signal coming in will modulate it from that default point. And we can change the frequency of the LFO to change how often that repeating pattern changes. So you turn it up, you can almost get like a tremolo effect. And if you turn it down, it's almost not even noticeable. 
See how slow that curve is when we turn it low? It's really very subtle. But it can kind of make things sound a little more human, a little more interesting by varying them over time. Now, it's, uh, I think, useful to note that an LFO and an envelope are both forms of modulation. The difference is that an envelope is kind of has like a start and a stop point. It starts, it has its four stages, and then it's over. And it waits to be triggered again before it does its thing. An LFO is a continuous thing where it just, it's like a, you know, like an oscillator. It repeats forever and you can change the shape and the rate and various other parameters, but it doesn't need to be triggered per se in the way that an envelope does. Now you could technically have an envelope that automatically loops on itself. Like as soon as it gets to the end, it immediately starts again. And those do exist. That's called a looping envelope. And that's kind of just like a fancy LFO where the drawing here is controlling the shape of the waveform in the same way that we're defining the waveform by which of these outputs we choose from on the LFO module. Similarly, similarly you will notice that uh, the envelope is also unipolar, meaning it starts at zero volts and it goes up to the maximum voltage and then comes back down. The LFO actually has two modes. I have it in bipolar mode right now, so you can see the yellow line is going both above and below the zero point in the middle. But if I set it the offset to unipolar, then it, it offsets that signal so that it starts at zero vo volts and goes twice as high as it was before, but it never goes negative. And you can hear how that changes the sound. So the difference there is that in bipolar mode, it's kind of moving the knob both left and right from its initial position. And in unipolar mode, it's only moving it to the right and it's moving it twice as high as it was before. It's just shifting the whole range of the movement. Okay, so our sound is once again much more interesting than it was. It's varying in amplitude or volume. It's varying in harmonic content because we filtered it. And also the quality of that filtering is changing over time because of our modulation with the envelope and the LFO. But it's missing still a very critical component of any sort of interesting music, which is the pitch. We're still just playing the same note over and over and over and over, which I don't know about you is, but is starting to get on my nerves. So it's time to change the pitch. Now, the traditional way to do this would be to play a piano keyboard or some other instrument that can send electric signals that can be used as input for this system. But to really make this easy for me to demonstrate and to uh, sort of hone in the point on the point that these voltages can be used for anything, you can take a gate or an LFO or a VCO audio, an envelope, and use that as input to anything else. And it really just depends on how the module receiving the value is interpreting that voltage, what it's doing with it that determines what it is. So as a result, what we're going to do is we're going to actually use randomness to generate pitches. So I'm going to take a module called Utilities. This is a software clone of a hardware Eurorack module called Kinks from a very popular company called Mutable Instruments. It has uh, three different things that it does. We're only going to be dealing with this bottom one. This is called sample and hold, and it's a technique for getting random values. Let me show you how this works. So let's actually bring another scope out. By the way, this is another really nice part about VCV rack is that you can just make a million copies of the same module. Whereas in the hardware world, you'd have to buy all of these and it just really increases the cost. But it's so useful to be able to learn by just adding as many copies of a module as you need. OK, so what uh, sample and hold does is it takes some sort of random source and then it grabs values from that random source and sends them out as static values. Uh, that sounds a little abstract, so let's look at that in a little more detail. 
see there's this noise output on the sample and hold module. If I send that in to our scope, we see this kind of uh, classic looking audio waveform. You probably recognize that shape. And if I take this out to our mixer, let's bring the volume down in case it's really loud. Ah, I turned down the master volume. And let's mute. Mute our oscillator. There, you hear that? That is white noise. And that's produced by basically a whole bunch of uh, harmonics that are happening all across the frequency spectrum in pretty much equal amplitudes. And the result is that you don't really hear like a discernible pitch in a musical sense. It's just noise. There's a bunch of different like qualities of noise, white noise, pink noise, brown noise, gray noise that all have slightly different uh, timbres or qualities that come from uh, accenting different parts of the sp frequency spectrum. But for our purposes, we don't really care about what it sounds like. The point is that this comes from randomly changing the frequency of an oscillator. It's changing the frequency so fast that we can't perceive a pitch, and instead we just hear kind of nonsense. But if we were to like, you know, throw a dart at this, and the dart hit it at a like an exact point in time, it would be the signal would be at a specific voltage, and if we were to capture that voltage and send it out as a static voltage, it becomes a control signal. So if we send, uh a trigger to this sample and hold input. Let's once again use the clock as the source. And then we take that output into the other input of the scope. You'll see right now that middle line, the yellow line is just constantly at zero. Nothing's happening. But as soon as I turn on the clock module so that it starts sending gates to this trigger input, now we see that whenever the gate goes high and a trigger is sent, the yellow line changes its position. But it only changes position at the moment that the trigger happens, even though the, this, the source of the randomness, this noise, is constantly changing. So that's sample and hold. The sampling is the grabbing of the randomness and the holding is keeping that value constant until the next time we grab a new value. So what we've effectively done here is we've got a source of random values. So let's get rid of the noise part because we don't actually need that. And let's move the random value here. So there's a control on the VCO on our oscillator called volt per octave. This is the pitch control that allows us to change what note the oscillator is playing. So if we take the output from uh, this random voltage source and we put it into the volt per octave input, let's listen again to what our oscillator is doing. And maybe we'll increase the BPM a little bit so we get notes a little bit faster. And suddenly we have pitches, multiple pitches. I should note that uh, volt per octave is the standard in Euro rack specifically for controlling pitch. And it's important to under, let me mute that because it's really annoying. Let me, uh, it's, it's important to understand that uh, this is a relative measurement. So there isn't, um, there isn't like a specific voltage value that, equates to a specific musical pitch like it's not like you give it one volt and it plays a c or something like that uh, this is a little unfortunate because it means that different oscillators from different manufacturers or even from the same manufacturer won't necessarily play the same pitch given the same voltage so you have to tune your oscillators to sort of start at a common baseline but the part that is standardized is the relative control so for every additional octave or sorry every additional volt sent on this volt per octave input the frequency of the oscillator will double which moves the pitch higher by one octave which is uh eight tones or uh, 12 semitones <laughs> 
So if we unmute that again, every time the sample and hold picks a new value, we send a new pitch to the VCO's volt per octave input, and the result is that we hear a different pitch coming out of the oscillator as audio. Because we're using the same clock source for triggering the envelopes and for the pitch, the pitch is changing at exactly the same time that new notes are played, but these could technically be desynced from each other. In fact, that's a good time to demonstrate. You see this clocked module has uh, multiple clock outputs at the bottom and these controls with multipliers here, ratios. Let me, let me mute this for a second. So these, this is called clock multiplication and division. If I turn this to the right, it's a multiplication. If I turn it to the left, it's a division. What that allows us to do is send uh, additional clock signals, like high and low vot voltages, at a different rate than this main clock, but at a rate that is an exact even division in terms of musical tempo. So if there's 70 beats per minute on the main output, and I set this to times two, then we would get 140 beats per minute on this first clock output. So let's do that just to demonstrate. If I just if I remove this cable by uh, shift clicking, and then I take the clock one output, which is multiplied into the trigger, now we're generating new values from sample and hold at twice the rate that we're triggering notes. So if I unmute this again, listen to what it sounds like. You can kind of hear that that pitch is changing right towards the end of the envelope as it's decaying. Let's increase it even, even more so you can really hear it. You hear that? So the pitch is changing more often than we're triggering new notes on the uh, amp and filter envelope. So it makes kind of a cool, like, a uh, sci-fi computer noise. And really, we could do the same thing with the filter, too. Right now, we have these two connected, but if we wanted to maybe trigger the filter twice for every note, we could do the same thing. We could set maybe clock two to two, and then we send that to the filter's envelope. You hear that? So it's got two of those kind of squelchy attacks per note. Okay, all well and good. Uh, but this still is not super musical. Like, it's more interesting because the pitches change. But the downside is that uh, it is not like playing notes that are part of a scale that we're used to. And so it just kind of sounds random. We can fix that with a process called quantization. So let's grab our quantizer, which is this little guy, module from VCV Rack. I'll put it on the left of the scope. Let's move these over a little bit so maybe they're a little less covered by cables. So what a quantizer does is it takes incoming voltages and it snaps them to specific values that are allowed. So if we get a value that's like slightly below what it would represent as this low C, it'll snap it to that C, so it's exactly that pitch. In most Western music, uh, we are used to a scale that has 12 semitones, which is represented here by the piano keyboard. And they're evenly distributed in terms of frequency. So like an octave from this C to this C is doubling the frequency and all of the individual steps in between are exact divisions that are the same frequency distance apart from each other. So if I take this output, and let's actually, let's take it out of the VCO, and we're going to take it into the volt per octave input of the quantizer, and then out of the volt per octave into this one. And unfortunately, those are the same color, so let me change this to a different color. 
Let's use maybe uh, green. Nope, that didn't work. Oh, I did a new cable. I meant to do green. There we go. Okay. So now you can see, uh, it may be a little hard to see because they're so uh, close to each other. But you see that every time a note is triggered, the yellow and green lines are kind of different distances away from each other. Sometimes they're a little farther apart. Sometimes they're very close together. Sometimes they're kind of on top of each other. That's the result of the quantizer at work. So the yellow is the raw voltage that's coming out of the sample and hold, just totally random voltage. And the green signal is the quantized voltage that's been snapped to the closest even division of 12. So depending on what random value we get, it may actually be very, very close to a quantized value, and hence the quantizer doesn't have to do very much, and those lines are closer together. But if it outputs a voltage that's kind of like halfway between two of these steps, then the quantizer is going to have to work a little harder and snap it to something that's a little farther away than the original voltage. Okay, so let's take the output of the quantized voltage, stick that back into the VCO. Okay, it's a little more musical than it was. Like, it doesn't sound quite as random, but it still doesn't sound very nice. And there's two reasons why that is. One is that we're playing in the chromatic scale here. So still any of the 12 tones can be triggered at any point. And that doesn't sound very good. Most music we hear is in a scale, major, minor, a modal scale. And that limits the notes that we can pick from on the keyboard. But it sounds more cohesive when notes are played in sequence. Now, because we don't know exactly what voltages are going to come, and they're going to be played in a random order. We're going to use a scale called major pentatonic, which is essentially all the black notes on the keyboard. And we're going to get rid of all of these white notes by clicking on them. And now all of these notes in, in any sequence will generally sound pretty good. So that sounds better. But there's still a little bit of a problem, which is that we occasionally get extremely low or extremely high notes. And that doesn't sound great either. It makes it sound more random. And the reason that happens, again, is because these are just totally random voltages. The quantizer will make sure that the pitches align to one of these sort of fixed points. But there's many octaves of pitches, and so the voltage could be very, very high, which is fine as long as it, you know, conforms to one of these sort of frequency ratios. Or it could be very low. But a very, very low pitch that's super buzzy doesn't sound very good. So what we can do is limit the range of those values so that they're still, you know, they still get quantized and fixed, but their maximum and minimum values are kind of squished in. Not so high and not so low. We can do that with our old friend, the attenuator. So we saw a little a bit of this already when we were dealing with these controls, like on the filter, to attenuate the signal coming in for modulation. What an attenuator does is it just takes some input signal and outputs the same signal, but reduces it based on the amount of the control. It reduces the amplitude. It's kind of like the, I guess it's really the same thing as a VCA, honestly, in this case. Like a VCA has this extra control that allows you to use a voltage to control the position, but an attenuator just has, at least, at least this one is not automatable. It you know, just allows you to use this knob to kind of set a fixed value for how much of the signal is allowed to pass through. So if we send, uh, it's actually, let's visualize this. So I'm going to get rid of that guy. We're going to send one copy. We're going to send the raw random value into the first uh, input of the scope. And we're going to send 
that output into the attenuator, the output of the attenuator into the second part of the scope, the output of that into the quantizer, and the output of the quantizer back into our Volper octave. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, now we're only hearing one note again. Why is that? That's because we have our attenuator set at its neutral position, which completely eliminates all voltage coming in on its input. So it's just sending zero volts out constantly. It's like ignoring our random signal. And you can see that represented here, where the yellow is the voltage coming from the sample and hold, and the red is what's coming out of our attenuator and going into our quantizer. But if we start to move this knob, it allows more and more of that incoming voltage to pass through. So if we set it at about 30%, 30% of the full range of pitch values is kind of like a, maybe an octave and a half. So now it's really starting to sound musical. It doesn't repeat in a way that's like predictable, like a lot of pop music would, but it's pleasant. Like the pitches are related to each other in a way that's pleasing. It doesn't go super high or super low. We have distinct notes because of the VCA and the envelope, and the quality of those notes changes because of the filter and the modulation from the LFO. Cool, so let's leave that as our melody. And let's add a little drum section to it. I'm going to add these drum modules from Hora. We've got a kick drum, a snare drum, and a hi-hat. These are sound sources. They're technically just oscillators, really. But they're very specialized to produce, instead of like a simple wave like this VCO does, it produces uh, sounds that emulate specific acoustic instruments. In this case, a kick drum, a snare drum, and a hi-hat. Now we're going to need some way to trigger these, because remember we talked about triggers as being high voltage signals that indicate that an event has happened, which is perfect for drums because they have their own built-in sort of decay. We don't need to know how long they're held down, you just need to trigger them. So we need something called a sequencer to give it a pattern that we program. For this, I'm going to use this 16-step trigger sequencer from Count Modula, and I guess I'm going to have to zoom out because we're getting a little wide on the screen. So let's stick this guy here, and let's mute this so we don't have to listen to this constantly. Uh, mute. Okay, so what a, a trigger sequencer does is it uh, sends high voltages in a space a specific pattern, kind of like a clock. I mean, it's really the same thing, uh, except in a clock, you know, it's kind of this type of clock is constant and it's just based on a musical BPM beats per minute, but a trigger sequencer will send either a trigger or nothing, depending on whether you want it to. So, uh, each of these buttons consists of a step and there's 16 steps because they're supposed to be divided into like a measure of music in the 4-4 four, four time signature. So these are like 60, each one of these represents a 16th note. And each row is a different uh, sort of channel that you can use for a different instrument. So we're going to use the first channel for our kick drum, the second for our snare drum, and the third for our hi-hat. So I think what I want is for a four on the floor kick drum, maybe with a little extra beat at the end to make it a little more interesting. And then for our snare drum, let's have hits on the second and fourth quarter note. And for the hi-hat, we'll just trigger all 16 steps. So this needs some sort of clock source so that it knows when to play, when to advance to the next step, because it has no concept of tempo itself. It just plays the next step whenever it receives a signal. So we're going to take our main clock. Actually, what we'll do, I think we'll use... 
a 4x clock, which will give us 16th notes relative to 70 BPM. And let's plug that into our clock input. And look at that. You see how it, these lights in the middle start blinking? And it kind of moves across linearly. That's because every time it receives a, a high voltage from this cl clock output on clocked into here, it's going to advance to the next step. So now I need to plug these into these triggers that come out of each of these channels into our drum instruments. Let's take the output into the trigger here, this output into this trigger. And, you know, actually, yeah, let's do this output into this trigger for a closed hi hat. And then we need to connect the audio out of each of these drums into our mixer. So we'll take the out of the kick drum into channel one. And you can already hear it. Snare drum and hi hat. And let's bring our melody back in too. That's a little slow, so let's speed it up. It's a little out of sync too because I've kind of plugged this in while the melody was running. So if I stop it and st reset it and start it again, I think it may sync better. We can also take this reset output and send it to the reset here, which will, when I press the reset button, it'll move it the active step on the step sequencer back to the first one. And I can actually click it any time to sync it differently. So now I've got a little beat. The drums are a little quiet compared to the melody, so let's bring that level down a little bit here on our mixer. Cool, that's a little more interesting. So as we've, uh, we haven't really talked about mixing in particular, uh, I kind of mentioned it a little bit at the beginning, but mixing is a way to combine multiple voltage sources and send them out on the same input all combined together. So usually it's used for audio mixing, although there are CV mixers as well that can combine control signals. In this case, we're using it for audio. We have uh, our melody from the oscillator coming in on channel four, and then our drums on channel one, two, and three. Each of these vertical strips is a channel. And we can control the, the volume. We can control the panning in the stereo field. So I can, if I turn this to the left, I get only in the left speaker or the left headphone. And then similarly to the right. And because this is Euro rack and modular, of course, we can also automate all of these controls. So I can take, for example, a triangle wave from our LFO and stick it into the pan input on our melody. And then when something is patched in here, this becomes an attenuator for that incoming signal. So if I turn it up, we'll start to hear the melody move back and forth in the stereo field. And the more I turn it up, the more dramatic the movement is. Cool. So there's one, a couple other things I want to talk about. Um, if you notice this hi-hat module actually has two sound sources in one. It's got a closed hi-hat and an open hi-hat. But right now we're only triggering the closed hi-hat. Wouldn't it be cool if we could sort of alternate uh, where we sometimes trigger the close and sometimes trigger the open? We could do that by using a fourth lane here and kind of just controlling exactly when they happen. But one of the beauties of modular synthesis is randomization and probability. And you kind of already did that uh, with the melody where we used a random voltage source to determine our melody. We can do the same thing for determining triggers. So uh, using probability. For that, I'm going to use uh, this module Bernoulli gate. 
This is a clone of uh, Branches by Mutable Instruments, the same company that makes this uh, Kinks, aka Utilities module. And this allows us to do probability control. So on this uh, C output, where it's just triggering on every 16th note that we're sending to this, uh, the trigger of the closed hi-hat, instead of sending it directly to the hi-hat, we're going to send it to the input of one of the channels on this Bernoulli gate. Uh, the, the red one and the blue one are just copies of the same function, so we're just going to use the top one. What this thing does is it allows us to take an incoming signal and do like a coin toss and decide at random whether that incoming signal will be propagated out of the A output or the B output. And then we can control the relative probability of how often one, of one or the other happens based on the position of this probability knob. So if we take the out A and send it to the closed hi-hat, and the out B and send it to the open hi-hat, and then we hit play again, we should hear kind of a 50% mix of closed and open that happen randomly in a way that doesn't repeat. And you can actually see that as these things light up, you can see which one is getting triggered. And you can see over here, and you, of course you can hear the difference in the hi-hats. I think a hi-hat pattern sounds a little better when the open hi-hat is a little less frequent compared to the closed hi-hat. So let's dial this knob to the left to make output A more likely than output B. Maybe about 70% chance of A and 30% chance of B. Nice. Sounds good. Okay. Cool little pattern. Now, the icing on the cake is effects. This is a type of audio processing in our category of processor modules that will add, well, effects to the audio. Uh, some common ones that you will have probably heard are delay and reverb. Those are the two we're going to use here. So for delay, I'm going to use the Chrono Blob 2 from All Right Devices. And for reverb, I'm going to use Plateau from Valley. And I need to zoom out a little bit more. Or actually, I don't really, because we've got these connected. I guess you don't need to see those two on the right. So let's leave it like that. So delay and reverb are kind of similar effects. They both work by taking a copy of the original signal uh, waiting a little bit of time and then playing the original signal back again so you get a copy of it like an echo. A delay is usually spaced apart uh, far enough that you can sort of hear the individual repetitions and a reverb is very 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 closely spaced together so that you hear kind of more of a wash of sound in the same way that you hear uh, kind of a wash if you were inside like a giant room like a cathedral or something like that and combine these effects can really give a beautiful quality. So I'm going to use uh, our mixer to send a little bit of the incoming signal into these devices, and then the, a little bit of the uh, signal coming back from them that has been processed back into our main mix. For that, I'm using a concept called send effects for, through this extension to the mixer. So this little channel on the left, you see the send A output? That's going to take uh, a little bit of the output of anything that I direct to it, and we're going to put that into the main input of the chrono blob. And then we're going to take the outputs, both left and right, because it's in stereo, and those are going to return to our A return. And then these controls right here, channel A, channel B, control the amount of the signal from one of these channels that is sent to that effect. So I don't think we want to delay the drums. Let's just do it on the melody. So I'm going to increase the amount of channel 4, which is our oscillator, our, v our VCO, that is sent to this effect. that so i've actually cranked it all the way up maybe we'll just leave these all the way maxed and i'll use the control on the effect itself to control the amount that we hear it so you hear there's like a an echo now that's the delay 
we can increase the amount of delay we hear with this dry wet knob. If we turn it to the left, we hear only the original sound. And if we turn it to the right, we hear only the delayed sound. But I think a mix of the two is good. I'm gonna turn the feedback down. The feedback controls how many times the echo repeats. Let's turn it down a little bit so we just get a little bit of copy. And then this knob in the middle controls the amount of time that the delay waits before it repeats. You can hear there's kind of a weird artifact as I change the delay time while the music is playing. But as you can see from the tooltip, these are just like exact times in milliseconds that don't necessarily have any relationship to the BPM that we picked. But the good news is that we can actually sync the delay to our musical tempo with this little sync input. We can take a copy of the clock, take this main one here, and stick that into the sync input. And now the delays happen exactly in relation to the beat, into the, to the BPM, to the tempo. And having this sync input patched also changes the behavior of this knob. So instead of it being exact milliseconds, it becomes a clock multiplier and divider, similar to over here on Clocked when we were changing these ratios. So if I go to the left, it will multiply and the delay will happen faster. And if I go up, it'll divide and the delays will happen less often. I think we'll settle on 1.5, as it kind of gives a nice syncopated feel. Syncopation is when a value that's sort of off of the main beat is accented. It gives it kind of a fun groove. Okay, so there's some delay. Let's use uh, send B to add the reverb in. So we connect the send B output into the main input of the reverb and the reverb, which again is in stereo, back to the return. And then let's increase the reverb amount with this channel B send. Let's go all the way up. There, you hear that? Really spacious, it really changes the character of the sound. Let's maybe decrease the amount of reverb a little bit so it's a little more subtle. it a little bit in volume so the drums are a little louder. Maybe just bring up the kick drum. Sounds so much better. So this is not going to win a Grammy or anything, but in the last hour or so, however long I've been talking, We've really come a long way from just producing a single pitch with no change in volume or quality. To something that's really very musical, very listenable. And it's interesting because it never repeats in exactly the same way. We've got probability involved in both the rhythm and the melody. We've got effects to sort of richen the audio beyond the basic inputs. We've got modulation to change the character over time. And you could really just kind of sit here and listen to this for a while. Good background music. Well, that wraps it up. Thank you very much for your time if you made it all the way to the end. I hope this was helpful. I hope it was clear. I hope you learned a lot. 
I hope you're inspired to go try out modular synthesis with VCV rack. It's an absolutely amazing tool. I kind of can't believe this exists. And beware that if you really get into this, it can be very expensive to do in the hardware world. But life is to be enjoyed. So if that's your thing, go for it. But you don't have to, because VCV Rack gives you so much of what you would get from the hardware world. And most of it is free and very easy to experiment with. Thanks again. Happy music making. (laughs) 